from Wondery, I'm Robert Moore, and this is another special episode of Over My Dead Body. Tell me his name now, I'll put him six feet underground. I was the host of season two of the podcast about a deadly feud between the so-called Tiger King, Joe Exotic, a notorious breeder and exhibitor of tigers and lions, and animal rights activist, Carol Baskin. And you want to know why Carol Baskin better never, ever, ever see me face to face? Ever, ever, ever again. That is how sick and tired of this shit I am. I spent five years reporting this story, which has some of the most unique real-life characters I've ever met. And now, it's all being brought to life in a scripted TV miniseries on Peacock called Joe vs. Carol. Carol Baskin? I'm Carol Baskin. Does the name Joseph Maldonado Passage mean anything to you? He is a psychopath who wishes me dead. We've been in an ongoing dispute oh. with Joe. I'm sorry, I understand this must be very hard for you. Oh, no, sorry, I'm allergic to cats. The man tasked with adapting this wild story to the screen is writer and showrunner Eitan Frankel, best known for his work on the TV series Shameless and Gossip Girl. I caught up with him just as he wrapped production to talk about this once-in-a-lifetime project. Hey, Eitan, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, Robert, it's great to talk to you. How are things? I know this has been a pretty stressful couple of weeks for you here, finishing up the show. We finished the show a week before it dropped. That was pretty much the pace from the beginning, um, was to, to try to create something special and do it as quickly as possible. Um, and uh, we're really proud of it and glad it's out in the world. So let's start at the beginning. What initially hooked you about this project? Well, I happen to be sent uh, a, a great podcast um, uh, about uh, Joe and Carol that, that you put together um, with the folks at Wondery. And I just found these people so interesting. I, I still remember where I was when I was listening to various episodes and hearing Carol talk about her brie and champagne. And I just couldn't pursue the project at that point because I was prepping another show, a limited series that we were about to go into production on. And a little something called the pandemic happened um, and that shut us down. And I got a call at that point about a week into the pandemic saying, hey, what are you working on? And I said, mainly I'm, I'm just trying to maintain my sanity at this point. And they said, what about that uh, Joe and Carol thing? I was so thrilled that it was something that I could potentially get involved in at that point. And uh, I just jumped in. I was able to meet with uh, Kate McKinnon over Zoom, and she was already involved in the project, as you know, um, and was very passionate uh, about this story and about Carol Baskin. And I just spoke about what interested me in this story and what I would want to explore. And uh, I guess it lined up with what she was interested in, and, and we said, let's do this. So before you listened to the podcast, did you have any awareness of the big cat situation in America? I didn't. I, I really did not know the, the state of big cats and, and what it's like for them uh, in captivity, that the laws for, for big cats are, are so lax and that in, in some cases it's easier to, to get a big cat than it is a puppy. Hey, kids, look how cute this little guy is. That'd be 10 bucks, please. Oh, that's each. Small price to pay for a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Um, these are enormous animals um, that are incredibly dangerous. Pretty much anyone can get them, put them in their backyards. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and, and then to think of, of the way that some people treat these animals is horrifying. So a lot of that was news to me. And I imagine it was news to a lot of people out there. It just seems counter to what you would think is logical. Most of this story takes place in, in Winniewood, Oklahoma, and in Tampa, Florida. 
And I'm curious, have you ever been to either of those places? Uh, and if not, I mean, obviously, once the pandemic starts, it's not like you could just jet off to, to Winniewood very easily. If you haven't been there, how did you go about capturing the spirit of those like two very particular places? Well, we certainly did a bunch of research. You know, we put together a writer's room and we talked a lot about those two places and how those two places inform the story. But, you know, also uh, Joe and Carol didn't spend their whole lives in those two places. I mean, Joe grew up, I believe, in Kansas, I believe some in Wyoming, and then spent a lot of time in Texas uh, before he ended up in Oklahoma. And, and Carol, I believe, has moved around a bunch too as a kid, spent a lot of time in West Virginia before she came down to Florida. So there were a lot of different parts of the country that influenced these people. To be honest, I, Winnie Wood, I would say, is not much of a character in the show, but Joe Zhu is a character in the show. Joe Zhu kind of takes on a life of its own and becomes this refuge for a lot of people who feel perhaps like outcasts. Joe refers to them on our show as the unwanted animals. He rescues unwanted animals in his zoo, and, and in a sense, I think he believes he takes in people who are unwanted animals, and, and he accepts them for who he is. And Carol, similarly, with her sanctuary, you know, we used to talk about in the writer's room that that was a sanctuary for the animals in her mind, but in our minds, it was also a, a sanctuary for her. Um, she had faced incredible trauma in her life, and, and this was a place where she could make the rules. Yeah, and I actually think that that's it's entirely appropriate to the story. I mean, having been to to Joe's zoo and to Carol's sanctuary, they both do feel very secluded in different ways. I mean, Joe's is in the middle of nowhere. It's just you know fields and fracking wells, and it's a long. He, he rarely even went into the town of Winniewood, besides to go to Sonic for a, a burger or something. Uh, he didn't have much interaction with them, and I don't think they were very fond of him. And then Carol's place was the opposite, where it was surrounded by shopping malls on all sides in this kind of uncanny way where you had this little pocket of, of wilderness. And, and both of them in their own way had created these little, I mean, you know, it's a fitting word, but little kingdoms for themselves, right? These little hermetic realms where they were in total control. I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, you know the, the real story better than I do, and, and you know these people much better than I do. But these are two people, Joe and Carol, the world had not been kind to them. Growing up, they had both faced a, a ton of hardship and adversity and, and real trauma. And I think their reaction to that was to try to create their own world where they could be in control um, because that was so different from the world uh, that they had been in. In our show, we, we make a point of saying that Joe's zoo comes literally out of experiences of being ostracized and judged because he was gay in a world that was sometimes hostile to him because of that. And Carol had been in a number of relationships that were incredibly traumatic to her, abusive relationships, physically abusive, emotionally abusive. And so she built this sanctuary um, where she was in control and she made the rules. And, and when she eventually met Howard um, and they started a relationship it very much felt like that relationship needed to be on her terms. Um, that's the only way it could be set up. Howard's a, a terrific partner um, who wanted to make that work. So, so you've written for uh, Gossip Girl, which is about like rich kids on the Upper East Side, but you've also written for Friday Night Lights and Shameless, which are about people in a small town in Texas and in a working class neighborhood in Chicago. So I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on like the class dynamics of this particular story? Because they're pretty complicated. They're really complicated. And I think people drew conclusions from the Tiger King documentary that might have been inaccurate. Uh, in terms of who these people were. Carol, I think sometimes people, their impression might be that she's elitist. She did not come from a wealthy background. Her family was very hardworking and, and instilled a work ethic in her, but she had to build her life from the ground up. You know, She was never handed anything. And then on Joe's side, I think sometimes people try to think of him in very simplistic terms as, as working class and 
pulling himself up by his bootstraps, but he came from a very middle class home in a way. I mean, they they had a, a ranch, but they lived pretty well, as I recall. So his 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 family before he left home. So, and by the way, there should be no judgments about any of those things. But it was surprising to us in the writers' room when we when we familiarized ourselves with the with the research that maybe what people's first impressions were weren't very accurate at all. Yeah, I remember someone in, in Kansas telling me that his mother came from uh, a family that was known as farming royalty. Uh, that was the, the phrase they used. And, and in fact, she wow. helped fund him his entire life. She, she gave him money, as you depict in the show. You know, she, she was helping keep that, that zoo afloat for, for a long, long time. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it is very complicated. One of the interesting things, and you sort of touched on this, one of the dynamics I saw coming out of Tiger King was that a lot of viewers who were, you know, probably comfortably middle class or even, you know, f- famous rich people were like laughing at, at Joe and John for being, you know, low income or, or addicted or whatever. You know, they're laughing at their like John's teeth, for example, or how, you know, the clothes they wear, how their homes are decorated. And it was oh, this feeling. I One of the phrases I remember seeing on Twitter was like a white trash dumpster fire, which I think we can all say in retrospect is is a pretty ugly dynamic. Um, I'm wondering, how did you navigate around that? That was very, very important to us uh, to try to portray these. These are real people. They're trying to live their lives the best they can. We, you know, some people might not agree with all their choices. That's okay, but they deserve to be treated with dignity and humanity and respect. And that was very, very important to us. And again, that doesn't mean pulling any punches in terms of portraying aspects of their lifestyle that some people might not approve of, that's fine. But you can still portray them as, as human beings, as three-dimensional, and, and as complicated as they really were with real feelings. And, and one example of that is we, we made a, a commitment right away that we did not want to make any big deal of, about John Finley's teeth. We didn't want to shine a light on that at all. We had an obligation to show the change in his teeth over time because that's the truth. That's the reality. And we don't want to distort that and pretend it didn't happen. But we don't talk about why it happened. We don't have close-ups of his teeth to to make a point or, or to lean into what happened to his teeth. To us, it, it was not important, really. What was really important was who is this person? Why did he find himself uh, gravitating to Joe? What did Joe have to offer him that he needed at that point in his life just out of high school? And what changed in their relationship? And then at the end of the show, how does he look at their relationship after it's all over? Those are the things that we found so fascinating about John Finley as a human being and made him so complicated and interesting. And I think to focus on his teeth would be to reduce him to less than all those things. And um we never wanted to do that. And there are other examples of that in the show. We just we, do, we really tried to keep a close eye on, on making sure as much as we could to never try to portray any of these people as part of a freak show or a roadside attraction. I really hope we were able to do that. And at the same time, you want to be able to maintain the, the comedic element of all this, right? Because there are, there are a lot of parts of the story that are funny. Hey, honey, I'm home. You look like hell, Joe. I've been on the road for two days. What's your excuse? <laughs> hey, new guy. John, is it? Yes, sir. How's the trailer? Comfortable? Yeah, real good. Mr. Exotic, thank you. Mr. Exotic's my father's name. Joe's mullet is funny. Uh, like, a lot of his antics were funny, and a lot of the things that Carol chose to do uh, were funny as well. How do you maintain that, that humor? How do you not lose the humor in the story while trying to keep it, you know, realistic and grounded? It's tricky. Because if the story gets too crazy and outrageous, then when you get to those quieter, you know, very realistic human moments, you might not quite believe them as much if you haven't earned those moments and, and, and the reality of these characters. But what helped us, honestly, is that a lot of the craziness in the show is true. It's not like we had to make it up. And a fair amount of it, the audience is already aware of because of your podcast and because of The Tiger King. No matter how crazy Joe got or, or some of the kind of quirkier things that Carol does, I think they're 100 percent believable because of most of them or all of them are real. And that allowed us to keep these uh, people in a place where it could get very, very funny at times and yet not become so ridiculous that you lost sight of their humanity and, and the reality of who they were. 
Yeah, before you started writing, I remember uh, you calling me and asking me very specific questions about like all, all sorts of uh, elements of the story, including, you know, Carol's first husband, for example, who sort of tends to get glossed over in most of these accounts. Uh, and so clearly you were pretty obsessive with like the research phase of this project that preceded any of the writing or the filming. Tell me a bit about that process. Well, I love research. Um, I was a history major, so um, and my mother was a history professor and then a lawyer. For a story like this, everyone in the writer's room did tons of research. And, and the most helpful thing to us was the raw audio of all of your interviews. You had... I want to say maybe like 10 or 12 hours of interview with with Howard and Carol. You had t hours with Joe, um, with Rinky, Cowie, Carol's mom, Carol's brother. Just incredible. It was an incredible treasure trove um, if you want to get to know these people better. Even then, it wasn't enough. But at some point, all you can do is gather as much as you can and try to make the best determination of who you believe these people are and, and what motivated them. And then you write the show. Um, so there's still questions that I have that were never answered, and they may never be answered. There's so many, to me, wonderful moments that, that make the show special for me, uh, and I hope for an audience, um, that, that came from those interviews and that is taken right from uh, these people's real lives and their stories. You know, knowing this material like I do, I noticed that your your rendition of events sticks pretty closely to the facts of what happened. Um, I noticed a, a couple of moments where you diverged from the historical record in one way or another. There are a few like composite characters and stuff like that, which is pretty common for a film adaptation just because you have to make sense of what's like a really messy uh, situation. I'm wondering, if there, were there any of those choices that you really just agonized over? You know, the the one that was hardest for me was the use of meth at Joe Zoo. There are a lot of reports of people using meth, and there's a real possibility that that drug influenced some of the behavior in the later years at the zoo by some of the people there. It was a very complicated issue. There were different stories about who was on it and who wasn't, and there were different stories about whether it was a personal choice or whether they were kind of pushed into it and whether meth was used as a tool for control. And there were different perspectives on that. And it was very difficult to, for me at least, to kind of weed out what I believe the truth was. And I didn't feel like I came out of all that research with a firm opinion uh, about what the right story there was. And so we handle the meth of it all, I think, with a very delicate hand. I think we reference it a couple of times. Um, but we don't really go very deep with it because I don't think we were sure what was right and wrong there. And I do think meth played a role in, in what that zoo became. And I wish we had more clarity on that, to be honest. And I want to ask you about the, the actual filming process now. So you ended up shooting in Australia, I believe. That's how right. did that come to be? And, and you know, how did that go? Well, I think when you think of Tampa, Florida and Winniewood, Oklahoma, you naturally think of Brisbane, Australia. So um, <laughs> shows are filmed all over the country and all over the world now. And NBC and, and Comcast have relationships in Australia. They film at least, I think, two other shows there as well. Um, and so uh, we packed up and went to Queensland. Also, at the time that we, that we put this together, COVID was very low in Australia. So it seemed like the best option in terms of our hopes that we wouldn't get shut down because of COVID outbreaks. Um, that was something a lot of shows were dealing with. They get a, a positive test or two and they have to shut down for a week or two. And, and that causes huge problems, scheduling problems, uh, financial problems. And so at all costs, you're trying to create an environment where you can actually make the show. And that's something that, you know, in my career, I've never faced before. I don't think any of us have. But because of uh, the pandemic, we, we had to go into these shows saying, boy, I hope we can actually make it and finish it. That would be great. And Australia, uh, you know, gave us a really good opportunity to do that. The Australians are wonderful people. They're so welcoming and they have an incredible acting community. 
We cast some of the principal actors on our show from the U.S. and, and from Canada. Uh, Sam Keeley, who pays John Finley, is an Irish actor um, who lives in Iceland. So we cast, I guess you could say, all over the world. But you know, 98% of the cast uh, turned out to be locals from Australia. And casting this show is not easy because when you look for an Anne McQueen, you want to try to find someone who looks like Anne and gives a, an Anne McQueen vibe. Same with Doc Antle or Joe's campaign manager, and it makes casting difficult. It was a joy being able to work with all these actors in Australia. Yeah, I thought the casting of the show was just was masterful. I mean, each person, uh, even down to the people who play, you know, Saf or, or some of these, you know, fairly uh, tertiary characters, they were spot on. Uh, and I wonder, the, the biggest casting question of all, I'm sure, was who should play uh, Joe Exotic? Where the fuck is Carol? I'm Howard Baskin. I'm Carol's husband, and I'm here on her behalf. We are hopeful that we can all be reasonable and come to some sort of equitable agreement. No! I come all the way to Oklahoma City, and that demon woman don't even have the balls to face me herself? Bullshit! Okay, sir, your language is... And I ain't talking to her limp dick husband who's only probably here because he's afraid she's going to do him the way she did her last one. How did you end up settling on, on John Cameron Mitchell... What was that process like? Was there anyone else you, you considered for the role? Well, I don't know if anyone else was considered before I joined the project, which was around March or April of 2020. Um, but once I, I became a part of it, um, there was no other offer made to anyone but John. There was talk perhaps of, of attaching someone before we were done with the scripts, but I think we all felt like we wanted to to write the show and, and then and then see where we were and, and try to find the right actor for it. And it's a hard part. I, I know there were a lot of actors who were very interested in playing Joe Exotic uh, because it was fun and outrageous. It, it's a deceptively difficult role because on the one hand, you have to be big and performative and hilarious. But then also you have to find ways to be very human and touch people and express how trauma affects you. Uh, in subtle ways, in nuanced ways. An actor for this role has to have a lot of tools in his toolbox to play this part. Um, and same with the Carol part. When we were ready to cast it, we got an audition tape from John Cameron Mitchell. I don't think he had auditioned like that in uh, like 25 years. I knew John Cameron Mitchell's work when I was back when I was living in New York as a playwright because he's a theater legend. He's a great actor. He's an incredible writer. Um, great director, singer, songwriter. I mean, he's just one of those people who he was just born to create. And we were all just blown away by his audition. He was able to really, in an understated way, get at the emotion underneath Joe and what drives him. And yet also play that big theatricality. You know, Joe is very performative. He lives his life on stage in a way, even when he's not on stage. He's in front of a camera a lot. He's performing a lot of the time. And some might argue, even when he's not in front of a camera, that Joe Exotic is a character to some degree that he's playing, that Joe Schreibvogel is playing. And John Cameron Mitchell is someone who knows what it's like to perform on stage. He also knows what it's like to be gay in a world that doesn't always accept you because of that. He spent time in Kansas as a kid, so he, he had familiarity with that part of the country. Um, and, and like Joe, he'd experienced tremendous loss in his life. And so there were a lot of different ways that, that John was able to tap into this character um, and understand him in such a deep way. And there just aren't that many actors who would have all those tools in their toolbox to ev even if they understood the character, to be able to realize all those different aspects uh, of Joe Schreibvogel uh, in a way that felt not like six different people in one, but six different parts of one person that felt connected in a way. There was connective tissue there. John is just a, a singular talent. And I'm, we, we were so lucky that he wanted to do the show. We're so lucky that he decided to, to send in a tape uh, after so many years. And he's amazing. One of the stories that John told me when I, when I talked with him was that he performed his audition in a pair of jeans that had a <laughs> zipper down the back that, that opened up. Is, is that true? He, he sort of performed in, in assless pants? 
You know, Robert, I, I had hoped never to, to think about that again. Um, but thank you for bringing that up. Uh, yeah, that was that was unique. I can honestly say I've been, uh, as a writer or, or showrunner in auditions for 20, 25 years, and I've, I've never seen an actor's asshole before. <laughs> um, so that was a new experience for me. Um, and it, it was shocking. Um, but, you know, what was interesting about that is I, I wouldn't say that, like, that helped or hurt him get the part – but what it did tell me was he was, as an actor, willing to do anything that helped him get at who Joe was. You know, whether that was becoming emotional in a moment or doing something outlandish and seemingly crazy. As an actor, John Cameron Mitchell is willing to go there if it's going to mean that you understand who Joe is. And he's fearless that way. And it was a great moment just to see... If you're going to go to Australia and put everything on the line to try to make this show that you really want to be special, John Cameron Mitchell is someone you want to go do that with. And now tell us a little bit about the casting of Carol. I mean, the, the, you know, Kate McKinnon turns in this incredible, hilarious, and, and surprisingly very touching and, and kind of almost uh, moving in a, in a political kind of way performance, which I was not expecting from her. Yeah, I mean, I think if, if all you know about Kate McKinnon is her work on Saturday Night Live, I think there, there are parts of the show that might surprise you, definitely. She's incredibly talented. We all knew how funny she was, but perhaps people didn't know quite her range as an actor. She's really, really gifted and a remarkably hard worker, and she was a joy to work with. Um, she was involved with the project before I was. Uh, she listened to the podcast and immediately gravitated to it. I think Kate is really fascinated by kooky characters. And also, I think she comes at, at, at a kooky character from the perspective of th that kookiness is not a negative thing. It should be celebrated. I love weirdos. I consider myself a weirdo. And so I think Kate and I were really on the same page in terms of our approach to Carol, which was what perhaps turned some people off about Carol was interesting to us. There are people who think maybe she's inaccessible or inauthentic. To us, I think I don't want to speak for Kate, but I'll say for me, if you think Carol is inauthentic, there might be reasons why she's built a wall around her. And let's get to know those reasons and understand why she might have done that before we try to pass judgment on who we think she is. And we wanted to explore all of that. And Kate was a remarkable partner. Um, I mean, she was involved in reading outlines and reading scripts from the beginning she weighed in uh, about certain stories. And then when we got on set, we finally got to see her as Carol. And it was just a remarkable transformation. It was very important to her to do right by the real Carol Baskin and try to portray who she was and what she was fighting for. Um, you know, we have a whole scene in episode six where Carol's at Congress. We spent quite a bit of time with Carol. Uh, Kate as Carol laying out all the reasons why she thinks it's so critical that this her uh, big cat public safety bill gets passed. Mrs. Baskin, this committee has many urgent issues to address. Why is this the one that demands our attention now? It is imperative that we pass this bill now because as we sit here, there are currently twice as many tigers living in captivity as there are in the wild. And these are cubs that are brought into the world exclusively for profit and exploitation. Think about it, Congressman Rutledge. These are babies, and we're allowing them to live in unregulated and inhumane facilities. And this is not just a moral issue. It is, of course, a public safety issue. 500-pound carnivores are dangerous animals who will defend themselves to the death. Did you know, in many states, it is easier to purchase a tiger than it is to purchase a puppy. Since 1990, there have been more than 400 incidents of violence involving big cats in private homes, resulting in 24 deaths, five of them children. Just recently, an employee in a zoo in Oklahoma had his arm ripped off by a tiger. So what would you do 
if a tiger got loose in your district? And what would you say to your constituents when they asked what you'd done to protect them? Those are the moments we wanted to, to do justice to Carol's mission. I think my feeling going into this was that the Netflix documentary, it felt watching it like they had put their thumb on the scale for Joe, uh, intentionally or unintentionally, I don't know. But it definitely, it, I, that was the impression I had, and I think that's the impression a lot of people had. And with our show, we did not want to put our thumb on the scale for Carol. We just wanted to take the thumb off the scale and, and try to be fair to everybody. And there are positive aspects of both Joe and Carol, and there are some that you might not like as much, and that's okay. There were no good guys or bad guys in this show. Um, we're just hoping that by the end of this, you understand these people better um, and that maybe we don't resort to labels quite as much. Uh, and we see these people for the complicated individuals that they are. The reason I used the word political a, a second ago, which might sound odd to some listeners given the the context of the story, is that I felt there was a, a kind of a feminist subtext to the, the Carol storyline in this, which is to say that if... Carol were a man, she probably would not have been treated the same way. She wouldn't have been treated the same way by Joe, and she wouldn't have been treated the same way by the public in, in the wake of Tiger King. Is that something that was in your mind while you were writing this character? Definitely. I mean, I th and, and, and again, in episode six, uh, when Carol goes to Congress, it was a big part of that. Um, I think part of the, the thesis of all that was that in order to build a life for herself and overcome all of the adversity that she faced when she was in her 20s, especially, and as a teenager. In order to overcome all that, Carol had to be remarkably resilient and tough. She had to be able to push forward when people kept telling her that she would be unable to accomplish something or, or that she was less than or that she was worthless. She had to have remarkable faith in herself and belief and do what a lot of people said was impossible. And, and, and that should be celebrated. Um, and then I think she feels, after what happens in Congress in that episode, that all of those traits were reasons why people don't like her, you know, because she's determined, because she's tough, because she fights. Suddenly, those are looked upon as negative things. That's very sad. Uh, and, and she's not the only woman to go through that, as we saw. <laughs> Uh, in an election. Um, so whether you like Hillary or not, um, you know, she had to fight for uh, uh, what she achieved. And she was similarly judged for being inauthentic or protecting herself and not being uh, as relatable or likable. And with Carol, you know, I definitely think there are parallels to be seen there. Yeah, there's a line in the show uh, and I can't remember it exactly off the top of my head, but something about, you know, I'm a hard-headed woman with a sturdy Midwestern accent, so something like that. And then she says, we all know how that turns out. And it's a yeah. sort of moment where the subtext is sort of uh, protruding through through the text for, for one brief moment. Yeah, definitely. And that whole episode has a real Trump versus Hillary parallel because Joe's dipping his toe in politics as well in that episode and, and running for governor. Um and, and, you know, what we were also trying to get at was, you know, all the people who left the Tiger King documentary feeling that, okay, Joe's not the best guy in the world, perhaps, but he's fun and crazy and look at the things he says. And we hate Carol. And people are allowed to have their opinions. You know, uh, you know they're allowed to, to like or dislike whoever they want. But I think what we were interested in was exploring why and what led people or a lot of people to feel that way. And I think that's a larger question in general right now. So another decision that you made in the filming was to use CGI versions of tigers and lions rather than filming you know, captive tigers and lions. Uh, talk me through that decision-making process. It was a fairly easy decision, to be honest. We didn't want to have animals on set that were caged animals um, that perhaps were mistreated once they left set and we didn't know. It's just complicated. Part of the reason we are doing this show is because we care about animals and we believe they should be treated humanely. The, the first decision was easy. Everyone after that was hard. First of all, it's very expensive um, to do all of that work. And, and I commend the studio and the network for committing 
uh, the resources to do that. And then on top of it, it's very hard to, to pull it off. You're, you, essentially, what you do is you shoot some of those scenes with either kittens or dogs, like Great Danes. And, uh, and we had a lot of rules uh, about how those animals had to be treated and how no one could touch those animals. And, and, and um, there were a lot of rules in place to make sure that um, those animals were treated well. And then the actors would interact with, with those animals. And then through the magic of, of visual effects, um, led by our incredible visual effects producer, John Helms, they would be turned into tigers or ligers or cubs or, or a monkey or a, a, ba a bear or a camel. And it was, it was a pretty incredible process to see. In the podcast and uh, in the show, there's an anecdote about Joe spray painting a sheep to look like a tiger. And one funny thing I noticed is that you also chose to computer animate the sheep, which, you know, it goes without saying a sheep is a domesticated animal. It's not quite as domesticated as a dog or a cat, but it's certainly not a tiger. It's kind of in between. Um, and of course, there's no shortage of sheep in Australia. So I imagine <laughs> there must be an interesting story behind why you didn't just use a real sheep. Boy, you're taking me back to about the second week of filming. Uh, so I'm trying to think back to like July or June when we were prepping that that scene. And I, I got to say, I don't remember a long conversation about that. You know, the, the thing you have to realize, though, with even with a sheep is to keep that sheep on stage involves prodding it, involves trying to control it. And so, you know, that's something that you don't always want to do. And if we're able to achieve something through visual effects and it's able to look realistic and we're able to make certain that no animals are harmed that way, that seems like a win-win for everybody. So going back to the topic of Australia for a second, I don't know if you know this, but my husband is Australian. And one thing he often talks about is how people outside of America think that like this is how all of America is like this is part of the reason why this story was so popular in, in England and in Australia is that in a certain sense, they think Joe Exotic is just an average American. Like everybody is, is that weird and that violent and everything is that over the top and colorful. Um, and so I'm wondering, did working on this story give you any insight into like the essence of America or, or what makes America unique in the world's eye? You know, that's so interesting because my experience when I got to Australia wasn't that the, that the Australians I encountered thought that Joe was representative of everyone in America. It felt more universal than that. A lot of times I kept hearing from Australians that people like Joe are in Australia. They just have different labels for them. I think the word they kept using was bogan, um, which I think is, if I recall correctly, is their version of, of kind of redneck. It was interesting to me that, that it felt like there are carols all over the world, there are Joes all over the world. And I think that's one of the reasons the show traveled. I, I, didn't, I hadn't realized, to be honest, that the Tiger King had traveled around the world quite as much as it did until I went to Australia and saw that it was a phenomenon there, just like it was in the States. And, and it was that way in many other countries. And I think it's because... Even if people want to judge Joe and Carol and, and uh, l look down on them in a way that is uh, unfortunate and unnecessary, there's also something about them that they relate to where they are, uh, which I find fascinating. Yeah, well, Eitan, thank you so much for, for talking with me. This has been such a pleasure. Oh, thank you so much, Robert. It's been great. From Wondery, this is a special episode of Over My Dead Body, Joe vs. Carol. All episodes of Joe vs. Carol are available on Peacock. Over My Dead Body, Joe vs. Carol is written and reported by me, Robert Moore. This episode is produced by Michelle Lanz. Managing producer is Lata Pandya. Coordinating producer is Olivia Weber. Sound design by Jay Rothman. Executive producers are George Lavender, Marshall Louie, and Jen Sargent for Wondering.